In the midst of anguish, the author of Psalm 98 asks two questions. Who can live and never see death? Who can escape the power of the underworld? These two questions, if we take them seriously, can rattle us at the core of who we are. That does not mean that we ignore the questions. For in fact, these are questions we need to be asking. Asking them in faith and in the setting of the faith community. It is here that we can explore them, trusting that God will journey with us every step of the way. Let us begin our time of worship.
gracious God, the first word from our mouths must always be a word of thanksgiving. You have blessed us in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Allow our thanksgiving to pour out this day. O oh Lord, we come before you aware that we have fallen short. Forgive us when we have uttered the unkind rather than the kind word. When we have done the bad rather than the good deed. We come before you seeking your forgiveness this day. And Lord, we ask that you would imbue us with, the, with, with new hearts this day. Hearts that uh, beat with your love. Give us new eyes this day. Eyes that see the world as you would have us see it. Give us new hands and feet this day. Your hands and feet. That we might bring your word not only in word but in action as we seek to minister to a hurting world. Lord God, we pray for all those who are hurting this day that you would bless them with your love. And for all of our women and men in uniform, we continue to pray. We pray these and the prayers of our deepest heart. In the name of Christ Jesus, your Son and our Savior. And we all say, Amen. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. 
And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, they hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word.
scriptures that have been shared and the music that has surrounded those words help us not only understand what is being said, what is being offered, but what is happening around it as you move and work and share. We ask all this in the name of Christ. A minister was teaching a young Sunday school class. And in the class, he asked the question, what do you have to do to get to heaven? Well, Charles, one of the participants, saying, shot straight up. And the minister, acknowledging Charles, repeated the question, so Charles, what does someone have to do to get to heaven? And Charles said, die. <laughs> That is correct. But when that question is asked, I think most people are looking for a slightly different answer. Something that's not so abrasive. Something that feels a bit more comforting. Maybe a quote from the Psalms. Years ago, I was at a wedding rehearsal dinner. And a group of us gathered over in the corner just talking. And one of the guys began to share one of those corny jokes about St. Peter, the early gates, three ministers die, they show up. I don't remember the punchline now, but we were all laughing. And as we were laughing, somebody else in the group began to talk about some program that they had seen, some funny TV show where somebody dies and they get returned to the earth and is living out of life. We were again all laughing and, and then somebody else spoke up and said, yeah. Have you ever had one of those moments when you're just feeling invincible and then BAM! Something happens and you come face to face with the fact you're going to die? And all these people just laughing hysterically <laughs> and moved to that kind of uncomfortable chuckle. And you can tell in their minds they're going, who invited this idiot? <laughs> we don't like to deal with that idea. We would rather postpone it, or avoid it, or do whatever it takes to not deal with it. Oh, sure, we can tell jokes. We can watch movies that depict it. We can tell stories as long as we don't get too close to that, that line. We want to keep a, a safe distance. But it was T.S. Eliot who said our lives are a constant evasion of ourselves. A constant evasion of we are constantly attempting to avoid the reality of what it means to be human. We dodge it. We avoid it. We dance around it, it being the big D. Death. And I think possibly one of the best things we can do is to take something from 12-step programs when they introduce themselves by saying, hello, my name is Bruce, and I am, and then they state their addiction, their brokenness, their disease. Maybe we could say, hello, my name is Bruce, and someday I am going to die. Put it out there. And yet still, some folks just don't quite feel comfortable. There is, well, there's a fear here. A fear of the unknown. And it's just human nature to fear the unknown. But our fear in, of death in this case is in fact a fear of that which we think we are avoiding. But in fact our fear is allowing it, death, to claim us before we even get there. In the book of Hebrews, it says those who fear death are enslaved by it. Though you hear that passage over and against what Jesus said in John's Gospel, where Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Well, how can you have the life, this life full of the abundant joy that comes from God, and be a person? 
person that is fearful of death and thus enslaved to death. For a number of years, I took high school juniors and seniors to New York and D.C. on what was called the International Affairs Seminar. We go every spring break. It was far enough back that when we were in New York, we would go to the World Trade Center. I have not been back to New York since the building fell. But I remember getting those youth on the elevator and traveling up so that we could go to the observation deck. And if you'd never been there before, you would have found kind of a, almost a, a place where you could sit up against the glass. And so you couldn't quite get your feet up to the glass. But you'd get your toes up to that little bench area, and then you could lean forward and put your forehead on the glass. And if you looked at the glass, you could see where many other people had put their foreheads on the glass. And as you leaned over there, stretched out, and then looked down, there was this feeling in the pit of your stomach, kind of a combination of both fear and fascination, insecurity along with exhilaration. It was a strange combination of emotion. Well, I think most people would rather curl their toes over the edge of a building than curl their toes over that edge that has them looking over into the shadow and valley of death. They would much rather be there on that building because there's something in all of us that wants to journey away or as far around to avoid that idea. But somewhere along the lines, something's going to happen. We're going to be sitting with the doctor, and the doctor says, I'm sorry, I have bad news. Or we are at the funeral for a friend, and we look at the obituary, and we realize that the deceased was three years younger. Or we go to the family reunion, and we look around, and we suddenly realize that now we're the matriarch, or the patriarch of the family. Have you been there? Do you know that experience? Saul found himself yanked from his donkey, knocked down to the road, there on his way to Damascus. Here was a man that was acting out of fear, a fear of the unknown, and he was attempting to attack it. But there on that road, he has this moment where he is taken out of his life as usual and forced to the edge, where he peers over. It says that for three days, was without sight, and in those three days he did not speak. Three days. Where do I know that from? The tomb. The author of Acts wants you to make the connection. This is Saul's tomb. It is an experience of him going over and into this, this experience of death. And even though he goes into that tomb, he is a man that then comes out a changed person. No longer Saul, but now Paul. But not just name change, but a change to the very core of who he is. How he views himself, how he views life, how he views God. Saul went to the edge not by choice, but because he went there was something undeniable that changed within him. We can try to avoid it, ignore it, but there will be a point when we are thrust to the edge and our toes are curled over and we are clinging on, looking into the abyss. I know that experience, being thrust into it. It came after a number of MRIs and a spinal tap and this 
prickly test and the doctor coming in and saying, it's multiple sclerosis. But it wasn't just that. It was six months later when I did the funeral service for a 43-year-old woman who died because of complications related to her MS. Thrust into that reality. Something you try to avoid, try to play mind games, try to put aside, and yet, bam, it comes to you. And all the denial, all the dodging, all the mind games just don't work. You're there. You're there. Just like Saul knocked off the donkey, moved to the edge. But I would like to suggest this morning that it is better to try to go there when you have a choice instead of being forced there. There is something about making the choice, the decision, that I'm going to go up to the edge and peer into that abyss on my own. There is something very empowering to do that, to talk about it, to be honest about it. Saul experienced in the midst of that Unknown, in the midst of his tomb-like experience, he experienced there the one who already had gone into the unknown and had come back and had promised Saul that he would walk with him every step of the way. It still remains an unknown to us, but what we have is a partner. A guy who will walk with us, who has already been there and come back. That's something that you can hold on to. And I can just imagine that Saul, now Paul, walked through life with a new spring in his step. Because he had gone to the edge, his toes had been curled over, he had looked into that abyss, and what he discovered was that the one who had died and had been in the grave and had come up out of that grave was now promising to walk with him into that unknown. And when you have someone like that, it changes everything. And suddenly, you're no longer a slave to the fear of death, but set free and able to live the life that Jesus was talking about when he said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. You can't have that kind you can't have that kind of joy unless you have been set free. And the knowledge that the one who has already gone into the unknown and come back, promising them that he'll walk with us, begins to set us free. One of my favorite movies of all times is the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Now, it has to be the black and white version, not that colorized stuff. This December, we're going to show it here at the church one evening. But there is a scene toward the end where George Bailey, the main character, has just gone through this experience where he has come face to face with the reality of his own non-existence. It was a death-like experience for him. And he's finally run to a place where he's standing on a bridge and it begins to snow. And if you're paying attention, you know at that point he has been brought back to life. He is now back on the other side. And Bert, the police officer, shows up. And there's a moment of conversation. At that point, George realizes, Bert, you know me? No, you, he says. Are you kidding me? I've been looking all over town for you. And I saw that your car plowed into a tree down the road. And I just... George, your mouse will leave. And George goes, My mouse will leave. My mouse will leave. Susan's Susan's pedal. Susan's pedal. He reaches in. Susan, woohoo! He says. And he runs over. He gives Bert a big hug. And then he starts running down the road. And he finds his car that's all smashed up. And his response is, woohoo! And he goes running down the road. And he 
Because they're waiting for you. And yet George doesn't care. He has a spring in his step. Because he's one that went to the edge. And he looked into that abyss and he came back. And now he's one that wants to live life. He wants to live life to its fullest. I'm sorry, but if you are stuck in the fear of death, that fear has already enslaved you to that which you fear. That's not the life God wants any of us to live. And so God has given us the promise of Christ to walk with us, not simply into the valley of the shadow of death, but the, the word there in Psalm 23 is through the valley to the other side, into life and life eternal. That is God's promise to us. And as people of faith, we need to embrace that. We need to celebrate it. And I am convinced that when you have that in you, people will look at you differently. They will see something. They will see a spring in your step. And they'll think, a little less maybe, but, but nonetheless, there is something that they see in you that they want. They too want to be set free from the fear of death. And God has promised us one that has already gone into the unknown, who will stand with us, who will take us by the hand and journey with us, whether that's one day from now, one year from now, 50 years from now. God has promised us one who will never leave our son. Amen.
Gracious God, you have invited us to not only worship as a community, but to live our lives in community. And this day, there are many who find themselves facing difficulty, those who are afraid, those who are grieving. And this morning, we lift before you Jim and Sylvia and Liz. We lift before you Martha as well. People who are grieving a loss in their lives. We know that you have given us a promise. And this day I pray that, that they and all of us will be able to, through faith, bind ourselves to that promise. God, we also lift before you Brenda and Haley, Ed and Ken and Delma and Bill and Dave, knowing that each one of them, through your grace, finds strength for what lies ahead. Gracious God, for all your many gifts, we are a thankful people. But this day, we are especially mindful of your promise that we will never be alone. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who was the model and the guide for that truth. And we continue our time in prayer with the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of God. I am I'm guessing that most of you found yourselves awake pretty early this morning. I was already up about 4.45 at my desk when the rain started beating against the glass. I was more awake as it continued to beat, and then the lights started to flicker, and then they went off. And I thought to myself, where's the flashlight? As I got up, the lights came back on, but I figured I'd better find it. I took another few steps, and it went off again. I came around the corner, the lights came on, and there stood somebody. My son. Can I hang out with you, he asked. <laughs> Absolutely. I took my notes for the sermon and went and sat on the couch. We sat next to each other in silence for a little while. And then I asked, are you okay? Yeah. Can I get up and go work? No. <laughs> Can you stay just a little longer? Yeah. There's something about having the physical presence of somebody close by. Someone with flesh and blood and skin and a presence so that you know I am not alone. But there is one who offers us an eternal presence. One who has been into that unknown, into the tomb, and come back, and now stands with us. It is that one, the Christ, that we meet at this table, as we break bread and share in a cup. It is the good news of that love that is eternal that we take into ourselves as we feast. Let us now prepare for time.
It goes almost 25,000 miles all around the world. And uh, on this Lord's Day, over the 24 hour period, there will be literally millions of people gathering like we are at this table. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the Passover with those whom he loved so dearly. After the meal, he took the loaf once again. He broke it, he blessed it, he passed it among them, telling them to eat that this was his body broken for them. In that same way, after the meal, he took the cup, Elijah's cup of community and welcome. After blessing it, he told them to drink all of it, all of you, that this was the cup of the new covenant, and that new covenant would be sealed with this sacrifice. We come together this day, like all of those around the world, celebrating his death till he shall come. Let us pray. Please join me in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy holy and sacred name. Heavenly Father, we come to you so often with thanksgivings. In prayers. Father, I ask you to bless us this day. Guide us in the direction that you want us to go. Father, we realize that there are so many problems, so much violence in the world today. I ask you to bless us, each one of us, that is of the Christian community, to let our light so shine that men might see our good works. And some of the problems and the violence that we complain about, that we can help eradicate. As we gather around this table today, in this holy communion, to take holy communion, as we walk toward this cross that's sitting on this table, that we will realize what it symbolizes, that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice that we might come one day come to live with him. As we take up this loaf, which is his broken body, that was given for us, and as we drink of this cup, which is the New Testament and his shed blood, that as often as we take of these elements, we will do so in remembrance of him until he come again. In Christ Jesus' name, I ask you blessings. Amen.
join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, these times and all things that we pray, we can always bring more of our us to give generously of our time, our talents, our love, our compassion, and our money, that it might be used to further your kingdom here on earth and to show your love to others, Lord. In all of these things, help us to be more generous and to return to you only a small portion of what you gave to us and gave that. Yes, in Jesus' name. A series like this, where we're going to be talking on the issues of death and dying, may not seem the most exciting, and yet I think it is so essential. I told both the previous services about an experience where a young man had gone through a couple of classes we were doing talking about these issues, and it was not two weeks where he had two experiences where he was able to draw upon that. First of all, having a conversation with his parents who wanted to talk about some end-of-life issues, but then also having a young friend who was in the hospital with a brain tumor that was in opera. And he was able to go in and not only talk about these things from a faith perspective, but also to help the family talk about some very practical things. And so this is not a conversation for those who are at a certain age, this is a conversation for all of us to be having, uh, because I not only think it, it helps us prepare ourselves, but it most definitely helps us deal with the fears that are associated. Here at Cypress Creek, we are always extending an invitation, an invitation into faith and into this faith community. If you wish to respond to that invitation, we invite you to come forward as we are singing on Hymn of Discipleship, or you can speak to one of our elders or pastoral staff members immediately after the service. Let us join our guests now on this hymn.
our lives, that in the programs and ministries of the church. Tonight, even though your bulletin says 5, it's at 5.30. We are going to begin the first of three evening discussions around this. Uh, Dick Maddox, who is a chaplain at M.D. Anderson, will be here tonight to talk about living wills and, and other things associated with that. So I hope you'll come and be a part of those conversations. Whether, again, you're thinking about it for yourself or you're thinking this is the conversation I need to have with mom and dad, depending on whatever age you're at. So I uh, hope you will come and be a part of that. Um, this Wednesday, begin a new series uh, on who is this Jesus? Uh, and we'll be doing it during the noon hour, brown bag lunch at 1130, study from 12 to 1, or you can come at 530 for dinner and the study at 630. So I hope you'll come and be a part of whatever we a four-week study on who this Jesus is. Uh, yesterday, they started to put the Christmas lights out over the property. You may have seen them uh, right around some of the trees. They will continue that the next two Saturdays. So I hope you've got a few hours this Saturday or next to come and lend a hand. Um, also want to lift up that uh, next Sunday, two important things to remember. It is all Saints Sunday. An important Sunday in the church calendar and the life of the church where we remember the saints. But also, if you want to participate in that, you'll need to adjust your clocks uh, one hour. Because otherwise, if you're coming to this service, you will get here, I believe, a little late. So note that next Sunday we will be adjusting our clocks. You get an extra hour of sleep, so it's a good thing. I invite you now to take the hand of someone. Gracious God, for all your many gifts, but most importantly for your gifts of love and the promise of eternal life, we are thankful. And we pray today that we can be the people who not only think about eternity as something beyond this life, but as something that is a part of this moment. For those of us that have gone to the edge and looked and discovered that the one who is eternal has promised to walk with us. May we celebrate, celebrate that truth and also take it to the world in the name of 